I'm Mark Sponsler, and welcome to the Storm Surf Video Surf Forecast for the week starting Sunday, May 24th. Tonight we'll be discussing jet signal winds, surface level pressure, significant wave heights, and all the things that go into making surf in the North Pacific Ocean. Let's get to work. Looking at significant wave heights for the South Pacific Ocean, we see an area of seas in the 30 to 32 foot range. Remnants from a gale previously that pushed under New Zealand and still producing some swell radiating to the northeast. Let's get into the details. As usual, we'll start off looking at jet stream level winds. These winds of about 30,000 feet help support the formation of gales, and when those gales form, help direct their track. We're looking for a trough, that is a push in the jet up to the north. We really don't see much. I mean, there's this little area right here southeast of New Zealand, and it's sort of pushing to the north. And what you typically find when the jet pushes to the north, it creates a clockwise flow, which is the hallmark of low pressure in the southern hemisphere. And that happens both aloft and down at the surface. And uh, low pressure, if it's strong enough at the surface, of course, generates wind. Winds generate seas. Seas, as they radiate away from the fetch area, turn into swell. Swell and hits your beach, wherever that might be, turns into surf. All right, so... But it all starts with the jet stream and with the trough, and we see really not a whole lot going on in the southern hemi for the moment. Then we get into Monday. We notice the beginnings of just the start of perhaps a trough developing, being fed by 130 knot winds. Now, it doesn't take as much wind in the southern hemi as it does in the northern hemi to uh, support gale production. So sure enough, I think by uh, Monday night, there should be something starting to develop southeast of New Zealand. You notice that trough gets broader, more defined, and being fed by a broader area of 130 knot winds up to 140 knots briefly there early Wednesday. Look at that. That's a, just a nice, big, hefty trough right in the middle of the South Central Pacific. Good for swell production, even into, this is what, Wednesday night, and we'll continue into Thursday. Still there and reaching pretty far to the north, too, like up to well, about 47 south, something like that. And then starting to fade and move off into Friday. So that's almost a, you know, almost a whole week's worth of, of production potential there in the central South Pacific. And then we get into next Sunday, and it almost looks like it's getting ready to start to do the same thing. And sure enough, there we go. A week out, another trough forecast in the exact same area. Now notice, back under New Zealand, big ridge here pushing south. That's the hallmark of high pressure. That's not going to do anything in terms of swell production, but it doesn't really matter. We've got one a trough that's basically to last all of the work week next week, and then another trough developing next weekend. So that's a pretty good start, at least at the upper levels. Let's go take a look down at the surface. Here we are, surface level wind, surface level pressure, remnants of the gale, still producing 40 knot winds. This is the previous gale that was under New Zealand earlier, uh, late last week into the early part of the weekend. 40 knot winds, getting some traction, we know, because we saw there's still 30 foot seas in that area. And that continues off to the southeast Pacific and supposedly starts redeveloping while another small gale develops under New Zealand on Sunday night. You know, sees a little tiny area, 55 knot winds, but most of the fetch, 35, maybe 40 knots, small area, 45 knot winds there, and 45 there as well. So some potential. Both these systems, this being pretty strong, but also starting to move out of the uh, uh, southeast Pacific, uh, out of the ca southern California swell windows we get into Tuesday. But notice, we know there's a big trough starting to be build here, and look, you can see already winds, maybe only 25 knots, 30 knots in pockets, 45 knots there. But pushing off to the northeast over a huge area and then building there we go nice pocket 40 45 knot winds pushing well to the northeast so we get into tuesday night and then wednesday 35 to 30 knot winds starting to back off some but just you know broad area so what is this oh starting about here it's uh 600 nautical miles for every 10 degrees so one two 
about two and a half, so maybe 1,500 nautical miles of fetch. Now, it's only 35 knot fit, fetch aimed off to the northeast. Still pretty impressive. Continuing, even as we get into Thursday and Friday, another system pushing under New Zealand. We saw that new trough building that area, 35 to 40 knot winds, and uh, lifting off to the northeast as well. Another system as we get into Saturday, 45 to almost 50 knot winds. Again, trying, it's not even till Sunday till that really is supposed to get, there we go, getting organized in the new trough uh, in the central South Pacific, 40, 45 knot winds. You get the idea here. Oh, looking even more impressive, 50 knot winds as we get into Sunday. So, of course, that's a week out. Do you believe it? I don't know. And then there's another system under Tasmania. Actually, things are looking pretty good for the southern hemisphere, and we know that there's already swell in the water. So this is significant wave heights from a week ago. This gale, this pushed under New Zealand. This was actually like Saturday, not a day ago, a week ago, seas got up to 53 foot. It's already starting to fade in this image here down to 52 feet, but you, you can sort of follow it. A good long fetch of, uh, and high seas pushing off to the east. The first energy from this swell, it's already hitting Hawaii, but notice the track was decidedly east to west, so it's only the minimalist sideband energy radiating up, radiating up, and it's a pretty steep track up towards Hawaii at like 158, so up, up in here. So it's, you know, you go look at the buoys in Hawaii, it's like a foot or a foot and a half or something like that at 18 seconds, 19 seconds. So it's even a miracle you get that much. But California is more up in this area, and certainly Central America and South America will get much more swell. California, maybe not huge swell, but certainly swell. And this system, I mean, because it's so far away and it lasted a pretty good long period of time, we're into Tuesday um, of last week, that swell will hang on for quite a few days in the California area. Then things started backing off, and then starting Thursday, was that two and a half days ago or so, another gale of pretty good magnitude did the exact same thing. Not as strong, but pushed right under New Zealand, now obscured by some of the smaller islands down here on Thursday morning. But by the afternoon, it was free and clear with 36-foot seas aimed off to the east. And it did its thing, too, now kind of falling more southeast. So Probably not a huge amount of swell expected from this one. We're going to run this out on purpose. All right. Now we're going to go back. This is, uh, we'll take it out to Sunday. Here's where we are. Whoops. Here's where we are as of right now. Now there's one other thing we, now take a look at this. There's this little gale. Okay. Not a whole lot on Thursday. Doesn't look impressive at all. It was at 20, 22, 24, 26 foot seas, you know. Then it built to, uh, what is that? 20, 22, 24, yeah, 27 foot on Friday, and then up to 28 feet uh, Friday morning to 30 feet. Now, just over a tiny little area, but it's pushing due north, and that makes a huge difference in terms of swell size. I mean, some really, not some not huge swell, but solid swell is expected into Southern California from this system Oh, about, what was that, late in the work week? I don't recall right offhand, but you can look at the charts and, and decide for yourself. Um, but decent, solid swell expected, you know, in the head high range or so, maybe a little bit more. All right. So anyway, now let's go take a look at the forecast. So we know for a fact we have one swell that's starting to hit just barely tickling the ba the buoys in California, and it's kind of not doing a whole lot for why. Another system from a gale that tracked uh, sa uh, south to north, that's coming. Another gale that pushed under New Zealand and faded out, and now we're looking for what else is in the water behind that, and we have these two systems, one forecast for the southeast Pacific. Now, we're not expecting hardly anything from this since it's all pretty much aimed off to the east, and this one Maybe not so much because it's not so strong. But anyway, you can see on uh, uh, Tuesday or Monday night, yeah, nearly 40-foot seas. Where did we go? Nope, there we go. Somewhere in there, 40-foot uh, seas, um, but all aimed off to the east. So probably not a whole lot happening there. But then here, as we get into Tuesday, gale starting to, to build in the trough. Again, 33-foot seas over a decent area, aimed off well to the northeast, continuing as it Wednesday. Thursday into 
almost Friday before it starts fading out, and then another bit of energy pushing under New Zealand with seas building from that. Again, not over a large area, but you just get the sense of this continuous swell energy. And now we're into a week out on Sunday. This system starts getting pretty well organized in the Southeast Pacific. So you just get the, I mean, in the Central South Pacific. So you get just swell after swell after swell. I mean, this is not a bad situation given the, you know, the long-term forecast and Make the most of this for sure if you can. And then a quick look up north. The models have been teasing about this system developing. Here we go. Starting Tuesday north of Hawaii. I mean, not much, you know, wind swell production probably relative to Hawaii. But theoretically, as you get into Tuesday night, seas building to, well, we'll just ramp it up here. There we go. 27 foot. Uh, yeah, 28. Yeah, I will say 27 feet right there. So right on the, uh, you know, good enough for, uh, let's say, from Point Conception northward, certainly energy for the Pacific Northwest and up into uh, British Columbia, if you believe it. I mean, it has been on the models for a while now, but it just doesn't seem really likely, especially given everything that's happening down south. But, hey, it's not out of the picture. And maybe a little dribble of something over the North Dateline region a week out, but we, we hold no stock in that at all. And then a quick look at wind swell generation potential for California. So right now, high pressure off the California coast, generating north winds 20, maybe 25 knots off of the northern part of California. And wind swell pushing into the coast, exposed breaks in San Francisco on down to Point Conception. Nothing huge, nothing exceptional. And that's supposed to continue, but then starting to... Yeah, maybe holding on into Monday or so. At some point, this low pressure gets in here and starts starts chopping out the high. We'll see how this goes. We get into Wednesday. Still, wind swell production, but this is like, you know, waist high, maybe chest high wind swell sort of thing. 20 knot winds. You really need a little bit more. You need a good fetch of 25 knot winds. That continues. We're into Thursday, Friday. There you go. Now, there's your wind swell. Also notice low pressure here, that's going to start creating an eddy flow. South winds pushing up into what we'll call central California and the southern reaches of northern California. That'll probably continue into Friday and Saturday and even probably Sunday of next week. And look at this low pressure theoretically moving up to the coast. Don't really believe it, but we'll keep our eyes on it. There might even be some potential for some light rainfall, but we're not even going to go look at the models because this is this is a week out. Basically, we're in a summer pattern, high and dry, pressure gradient in effect, in effect north winds down the coast, local wind swell, and then accentuated by what appears to be a pretty good stream of nonstop southern hemiswell. All right, so let's go take a look long term. What's going on with the Madden Julian oscillation and El Nino or La Nina? So, first off, we start looking for the MJO or looking at the MJO for the presence of the active phase of the MJO. The active phase basically is like a low pressure system that periodically travels from west to east on the equator. This is the equator here. This is the East Pacific here, West Pacific there. There's New Guinea. And specifically, we're looking for the production of Kelvin waves, which can sometimes, if they happen in close enough succession driven by the active phase of the MJO, can help kick off El Nino. Now, we don't think that's going to happen. In fact, we pretty much know we're nowhere close to that happening. We'll do the inspection just the same. All right, so this data from the TAO buoy array, series of buoys strung across the equator used for monitoring El Nino. We're just looking at the arrows, and the arrows indicate that winds are from the east pretty strong over the East Pacific, Central Pacific, and then in what we call the Kelvin Wave Generation Area, this area in the far west Pacific that when the active phase of the MJO is over it, the MJO typically depresses or suppresses trade winds, if not out and out reversing them. And that in turn can take uh, can take warm water that's here and start pushing it off to the east underneath the equator in the form of a Kelvin wave. All right, so east winds in control, looking at anomalies, the differences from normal for this time of year. I mean, it's pretty typical that winds blow hard east over the Pacific this time of year. But we look at the arrows, they're blowing a little bit harder out of the east in the far east Pacific. And then continue pretty much neutral over the Central Pacific and then harder than normal over 
the far west Pacific, the Kelvin Wave Generation Area. So indicative of the inactive phase of the MJO, or at least certainly not indicative of the active phase of the MJO. And what's been going on the past five days? So we look at wind anomalies again, 850 millibar vector wind anomalies. This is in the surface this is up about what they call the 850 millibar level, which is about 4,700 feet up in the air. Anyway, here's our chart. South America, Central America, the equator right on zero right there. Dateline right about there. Australia, New Guinea right there. Kelvin wave generation area right in this area. You see the blues, you see the arrows blowing from east to west. So that the blues mean stronger than normal trade winds in that area. That was on the 18th of May. Same deal on the 19th, the 20th, the 21st, the 22nd. You get it. East anomalies in control of the Kelvin wave generation area, certainly smelling like the inactive phase of the MJO. At least that's what it's been for the past five days. Let's go dig a little deeper. Then we go look at the forecast. All right, this is the whole planet on one chart. This is 850 millibar zonal wind anomalies. Again, just the east-west component of the wind. The Kelvin wave generation area slash far west Pacific starts about 135 east, so right up there. And the far uh, uh, east Pacific goes to about 80 west over here, right where that seam is. Kelvin wave generation area from there to about 170 west. So you can see right here the blues, strong east anomalies. They started in like mid-May. They've been blowing nonstop. Today, it looks like they're fading and pushing off to the east here. And that's kind of good news. This, this is, if you ever wanted to see an inactive phase of the MJO, this is what it would look like. Strong east anomalies. And then the forecast for the next, this is just the next week in the Kelvin wave generation area. Generally kind of a mixed bag of light east anomalies. Maybe a hope for a little bit of west anomalies the last two days of the week, but you know, nothing nothing clearly in, indicating the active phase of the MJO. In fact, this is what the active phase would look like, but it's in the Indian Ocean, not forecast to leave the Indian Ocean, and just opposed to fizzle right there. So let's go out two weeks. Now we can't look at winds, but what we can look at is outgoing long-wave radiation, potential for rainfall. The blues suggest Areas favorable for rainfall, that's negative outgoing long rain wave radiation anomalies, less basically a bunch of clouds preventing sunlight reflectivity off the ocean surface. And that looks like the active phase of the MJO, or at least a component of it, uh, starting today, continuing five days out, 10 days out, then fading about two weeks out. So that's sort of good news. That means the and the inactive phase building strong in the Indian Ocean and trying to ease east. This per the statistic model, the CA model right there. Okay, and then we go to the, uh, see if we can get this centered right there. There we go. All right, the uh, dynamic model now suggests the active phase of the MJO is supposed to take a little headway five days out and really start dying 10 days out and all but gone with the inactive phase of the MJO making quick headway back into the West Pacific two weeks from now. So a bit of a discrepancy between the two models. Quick look at phase diagram charts, fancy way of being able to determine how strong the MJO, where it is, the active phase is, and what it's going to do uh, two weeks, up to two weeks from now. So assume this, how to read this chart. You're looking down on the North Pole, the MJO, active and inactive phase, moved from west to east from the Indian Ocean over the maritime continent, over the west and east Pacific, under the United States, across the Atlantic, over North Africa, back to the Indian Ocean. The heavy dot is where the active phase is. The further away from this circle it is, the stronger it is. So a moderate active phase of the MJO, leaving the maritime continent and forecast moving to the West Pacific about a week from now, and then ba basically falling apart there and dying two weeks out. This per, see there's your CA, the CA model, and then two other statistic models there. Now, the dynamic model, the GEFS model, basically says the same thing, but with the MJO moving much quicker, one, two, three, four, five, and out of the West Pacific five days from now, racing off to over the East Pacific and over, I would say, uh, the Atlantic, somewhere the Atlantic, almost to North Africa, and then collapsing there two weeks from now. So one says slow moving, collapsing. The other says fast moving and not collapsing until way past uh, the Pacific. 
40-day upper level model. This is a statistic model. It suggests the active phase, and this runs about a week ahead of what's actually going on. As said, the greens are areas favorable for precipitation. Suggests area, uh, the active phase, weak, but in the West Pacific and moving off to the east quickly and over Central America on June 13th with the uh, inactive phase building by June 3rd into the West Pacific a bit stronger and making its way across the Pacific into Central America on June 28th and then basically a neutral pattern after that neither active nor inactive following. So if anything the dominant uh, MJO pattern for the coming 40 days is probably the inactive phase and that's typically what happens when you're in the in a, uh, the uh, a La Nina sort of situation. The inactive phase is in control and the active phases of the MJO when they happen tend to be kind of weak, incoherent, and don't get very good traction. All right, one month forecast. This is 850 millibar winds again from the CFS model. It goes out one month. Here's where we are today, Kelvin wave, well, the Kelvin wave generation area from 135 east to about 170 west right there. And here's where we are. You see there's our strong east anomalies that are past now. That was, you know, a week ago or so. And east anomalies on the uh, currently where we are today in the forecast, looking forward, a little pocket of west anomalies associated with a very weak active phase of the MJO maybe a week from now, and that disappears, and then you just get this sort of mixed bag of east and west anomalies in the Kelvin wave generation area for three weeks after that, but mainly favoring east anomalies, sort of a, a and no real clear MJO signal at all. And then the three-month model. Now, this is in reverse. This is past performance here. This is the forecast above. You just look at the forecast and go, okay, well, here's the date line. Well, it's right there. And the Kelvin wave generation area is like right over here, but the Pacific in general is up to, you can see the seam right there. So this whole area right in here is the Pacific and just a marked major footprint of East Anomalies forecast starting you know, June 10th and continuing the whole way through August. And if anything, they are to retrograde and start working their way into the Kelvin wave generation area as we get into August. All right, so let's overlay the MJO. Where are we at right now? And this is about as weak an MJO signal as you could possibly want. No strong active phase. So the active phase is a thing that sort of beats down trades. If you don't have strong or even moderate active phases, the MJO, then the, the ocean just does what it's going to do and it starts producing trades and that's how you get this this strong trade wind buildup because there's nothing to knock it down. It just starts getting momentum and starts digging in and it's a pattern and it just doesn't stop and that's what we think is going to happen as we get into fall. So anyway, you see, yeah, some sort of a weak one. Uh, oh, yeah, the solid contours of the active phase of the MJO, uh, you know, but an ineffective active phase of the MJO. I'm barely even west. At, it all it does is prevent the trades from nuking too strong. <laughs> and then another one here in the July time frame. But, you know, just just not a great pattern. Now, he, why is all this? Well, okay. Here is the real teller. The low-pass filter, all right? Solid contours are a low-pressure bias, basically, and if you get two of them or three of them, that's sort of like an El Nino indicator. This is where we were in the past, February, March, April. We had this low-pressure bias. It had been going on for two years. Um, it died in early May, and then you see a dotted line here. That's the, the opposite, a high-pressure bias starting to build in the Pacific with the low-pressure bias now moving into the Indian Ocean, this is classic La Nina kind of setup. You have high pressure in the Pacific, low pressure in the Indian Ocean. So wind moves from highs to lows, right? That would be east trade winds moving from the Pacific into the Indian Ocean. And that just, yeah, that's what you would expect during a, a La Nina sort of buildup. All right, enough of the MJO. Let's go see what's going on in the ocean. We're talking all El Nino sort of stuff, El Nino, La Nina type situation. And let's see what the ocean's doing to either feed 
or not feed an El Nino type situation. This is the West Pacific here, East Pacific here, data from the TAO buoy array. These are the anchor lines on the buoys. The X's are the sensors on those anchor lines. They capture data. They uh, Then you take a model to fill in the gaps, and what you end up doing is getting a, a subsurface profile of water temperatures. And you can clearly see, so this is in centigrade. This is 30 degrees centigrade, uh, warmer than normal water, or not warmer, but the warmer water is in the West Pacific, and you can see the extent of the warm water, the 20 four degree isotherm right here. It was down at 50 right there. That was 50, almost 50 meters deep a couple of weeks ago. Now it's right at the surface and barely hanging on. Your sense, the sense is, is that warm water is retreating from the East Pacific, moving to the West Pacific. Why is that? Well, trades are nuking, so it's just blowing it all out of the picture. And there's no Kelvin waves in flight. There's no massive eastward push of warm water because there's no active phases of the MJO to create Kelvin waves. So there's no machine to feed uh, warm water movement to the east. That's typically what you see when you get a La Nina situation. In fact, here is anomalies, differences from normal from this time of year. Whatever warm water you have, and that's one degree centigrade above normal, that's like nothing. And it's not moving anywhere because it was filling this whole area three weeks ago. That's all gone. The last Kelvin wave of what's been six and probably more like eight uh, over the past two years is gone. Instead, we have cool water, three, almost four degrees below normal in a large pool upwelling now to the surface. Why is that? We got East Trades just nuking. It's just causing upwelling and this cool water pool was already there and it's just starting to tap it cause it to erupt to the surface so basically the uh, an anti-kelvin wave if you will the exact opposite of what you want to help support storm production why is that well kelvin waves active phase of the mgo warm water in the east pacific feeds the jet stream pushing over the e the north and southern he uh, hemi regions of the Pacific, and that again feeds storm pr uh, production in winter months in the Gulf of Alaska. A little less correlated uh, in the southern hemisphere during the southern months, but clearly it looks like a La Nina pattern setting up. Another model, higher resolution model, basic of the same using the same raw data, paints the exact same picture. Massive pool, cool water. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, <laughs> five degrees below normal. That's cold. And remember, that's centigrade. So you can almost double that. <laughs> yeah, you know, it'll say eight, eight and a half degrees below normal. And you see it literally upwelling to the surface here. Yeah, a couple little warm patches left, but that's all going to be gone as this cool water just totally sets up, takes control. Uh, and Whatever warm water there is, it's locked and being held off to the east by strong easterly trades. No Kelvin waves, no active phases of the MJO. This, I think, is our future for a good long while to come now. Another sort of confirmation of the same data, this is sea level anomalies. Okay, rather than temperatures, this is the, the ocean's height from the Jason 3 satellite, strip out the waves, strip out the wind waves, strip out the tides. And we're looking for a bump or a depression on the ocean surface. We see positive anomalies, zero to five centimeter anomalies here. Warm water at depth when it when it uh, is when it's warm it expands and that again displaces water above it on the surface and creates a bump on the ocean surface. That's that bump. Uh, to the east you have a depression, minus 10 centimeter anomalies, and they're building down the coast of Peru, off of Ecuador, up into Central America, all suggesting cold water or cool water at depth over this entire area. This is starting to look like the typical uh, La Nina signature. Upper ocean heat anomalies. So this is a historical look at what's been going on east, west Pacific here, east Pacific here. The blues are colder than normal. The reds are warmer than normal. These are Kelvin waves. This is back in June of last year. Two Kelvin waves stalled. They didn't make it to the East Pacific. We thought we were going into La Nina then, but no, miraculously, somehow, the atmosphere pulsed again. We got a westerly wind burst, active phase of the MJO in September, created a Kelvin wave. You can see here, warm water made it the whole way to Ecuador. Another two 
uh, active phases of the MJO in December and February, created a Kelvin wave that sort of merged together, didn't quite make it to Ecuador. And with that, literally, there was no energy left in the atmosphere. The the MJO completely collapsed. And then you see the emergence of cold water developing here in the East Pacific with no warm water anywhere in sight and no active phases of the MJO anywhere in sight to try to prevent this from forming. So we think it's getting a good toehold in now and a cycle is getting set up. Upper ocean heat anomalies, it's basically the same as the previous chart. I think it's the upper 300 meters of the ocean. This is from the area from 100 west out to the dateline. And you can just see the presence of warm water back a year ago. And then as we got into last winter and uh, last fall and last winter, and now here we are, April 1st, it's just like somebody flipped a switch. It's nothing but colder than normal water right now in control down 300 meters. And then we move to surface, sea surface temperature anomalies, right? It's these these images, there's not two streams, it's all one. They kind of not completely overlap, so it's not a seamless image, but it's a good close-up view of what's going on. So Central America, Mexico, South America there, uh, the Galapagos right there. And you can see a clear cool stream. Well, there's actually some cool water now starting to develop along Peru, some cool water along the Galapagos, and a clear cool pool on the equator from, we'll say, 100 west the whole way out to almost, uh, what is that, uh, the date line right there. Classic uh, a La Nina signature, cool water in control. Now, you notice there's warm water to the north, right? Okay, that was our warm water uh, El Nino-like pattern from last winter. It's still there. It's still lingering, but that's remnants. This is all new. This is like just in the past week or so that this has been evolving. And then the trend, this chart here, this is South America. Here you can see cool water starting or temperatures cooling off of Peru, off of Ecuador, and streaming along the equator out to about a point. Now there's Hawaii there, so not quite south of Hawaii. Yes, there's pockets of warming here and there, but it's this persistent cool trend. Also notice, notice off of Africa, cool little trend developing right there too. Now also notice lots of warming in the Gulf of Alaska, down in the Caribbean, all over the main storm development region. There's the Cape Verde Islands. The Atlantic will be the thing to watch this summer as we think a La Nina is developing. El Nino tends to create a lot of shear, a lot of wind out of the west and upper levels of the atmosphere, cutting off the the uh, tops of developing hurricanes. La Nina does the opposite. The wind tends to shear is lessened. You have less wind in the upper levels of the atmosphere here, allowing hurricanes to organize from the surface up you know, 60,000 feet of the air without get you know, and create basically a good column to evacuate warm water down at the surface and warm temperatures in the air to flow up the center of the cyclone. And that's what a hurricane basically is. It's a, it's a way to get heat out of the atmosphere down at the surface and, and spread it into the upper levels of the atmosphere to tr try to get the, the earth and the ocean temperatures to regulate the heat and cool down a little bit. So favorable environment here for hurricane production. And then here's the backed off consolidated view. Pretty obvious, cool water developing along Central America and then out over the equator, your typical La Nina, we'll call it a weak La Nina signature. All right, so then what are we looking at here? So here's May 19th of this year, the cool signature. This is from May 19th, 2016, the last, the start of our last La Nina cycle. And you just compare the two images like, Okay, well, the one from 2016 at this time was a little bit more evolved in that it was closer to Ecuador. We don't have that here. This one's a little broader. This one, eh, they cover about the same area. Notice there was a lot more warm water around this, and this ended up being a fully evolved La Nina. There's not even nearly as much warm water in this year's event. The question is, how much of a La Nina will develop from this? Well, we're going to have to see, and we'll dig into that in a little bit. 
All right, what does the atmosphere think is going on? Does it think we're in La Nina or even moving towards La Nina? So we look at the Southern Oscillation Index, difference in pressure between Darwin and Tahiti. Tahiti is over the Pacific, Darwin, Indian Ocean. When pressure is lower in Tahiti, the index goes negative. If it stays negative long enough, you know, for like maybe 15 days, that now would be a good indication that maybe you're moving into the active phase of the MGO. If it stays negative for 30 or 60 or 90 days, then maybe that's a good indication you're moving into El Nino. Today's value minus 4.42, but yesterday's was plus 5. The daily number is very noisy, but you can just sort of eyeball down here. It almost looks like it's been a lot more positive than it has negative on the balance. The 30-day average, that'll, that'll sort of squeeze all that noise out today at 2.03, and looking down, it's been positive. Eh, it, we were negative, down to minus 2.8. Uh, eight seven a month ago so we're definitely trending towards the positive the 90 day average today at minus 1.24 but we were down at minus 2.91 i mean yeah we're we're easing our way slowly towards neutral per the 90 day average but remember that it's averaged over 90 days so this doesn't react very quickly and also remember that low pressure bias thing that was over the Pacific and is now gone and the high pressure bias has moved in, this will start reflecting that, we think, in about a month to six weeks, something like this. You'll see this index be positive. And if we're moving into La Nina, it'll start moving markedly positive somewhere in the plus 10 to plus 12 range, something like that, maybe as we get into oh, November time frame. Here's a 30-day average graphed out just so you can see where it was going. Uh, back in 2018, we were positive coming off of a La Nina. In 2019, we thought we were moving into El Nina. We were negative. I mean, the SOI suggested we were negative, but, you know, storm-wise and jet stream-wise, eh, there wasn't any clear indications of it. And then this year, you can see actually somewhere around Oh, maybe October of last year. That's as negative as we got. And the trend has been steadily upward since then. And we think it's going to continue to move upward probably somewhere into this range as we get into, again, the November, December time frame. We didn't show this chart earlier, but let's take a look at it because it is important. Uh, Nino 1.2 index. What's that mean? Sea surface temperature anomalies. Differences from normal right there. For the Nino 1.2 region, that's the area right there along Ecuador, Peru, and over the Galapagos. Temperatures, water temperatures trending steadily downward. You see that today's value minus only 3.95, three tenths, almost uh, four tenths of a degree below normal. We think that's going to continue to fall. And the official El Nino, the official El Nino monitoring region, the Nino 3.4 region, that's on the equator from south of California out to almost the dateline. You can see the trend here. It just a marked drop. We were up at you know, about 0.65, a little over half a degree above normal. Today, we're down to minus 0.37, so a third moving towards minus half a degree below normal. So uh, definitely a downward trend suggestive of La Nina. And then the official forecast from the CFS model for the Nino 3.4 region, sea surface temperature anomalies. This model has been doing a remarkably good job. Many of the models were saying, oh, you're going to be neutral. You know, we're, temperatures are just going to hang. Maybe they'll dip a little. But this model, we're just putting more stock in it lately. So the solid line is actual temperatures. And the last reading was, oh, let's say early first week of May, something like that. We were dead neutral. The model is saying that we're supposed to be half a degree below normal by July, well, we're at, what, minus 0.395 right now, so we're almost in June. That's about what the model's saying. We're supposed to get to a half a degree below normal, and you have to be there for five consecutive three-month periods to get yourself to La Nina. The model suggests a continued dip by October down to about minus 0.75 or maybe even eight-tenths of a degree below normal as we get into the fall. And by then, that should surely get you into La Nina territory. And then supposedly holding through January and then rising. This, 
I think would be a good outcome if it actually does this. If it goes, it could potentially go deeper. I mean, maybe it won't do this, right? Again, you're looking at models. You're trying to guess what's going to happen five, six months from now. None of the models are great. This model's been, it's at least dug in and suggests this is what it's going to be. And there's now two other major U.S. models that are saying the same thing. So we're, we're thinking that this is probably as good a forecast as any for right now, though some say this model has its biases and it's biased too much in the cold direction. But we're going to go with it for now. I mean, just looking at the ocean, you know, the first part, one, we've been in a warm regime for two years. It would not be unexpected that, and the trades have collapsed, and there's no energy left and there's no Kelvin waves and the active phase of the MJO is just like, you know, giving up. So it would not be unexpected to see trades just nuking for a while. We get a bunch of upwelling and temperatures drop off. And this is totally fits that kind of a model. And this model, again, has been projecting this for months and it appears to be verifying and being true. So, so much for the doom and gloom. The reality is right now, the Southern Hemi is looking pretty good. I mean, we've got just storm after storm, or at least gale after gale either has already happened, and there's multiple, at least two decent Southern Hemi swells in the water, if not three, on their way. You know, and it, from under New Zealand, it takes about 10 days to get to California and a week to Hawaii. Uh, most of them aimed better at, we'll say, California down into Central America than Hawaii. But Swell, nonetheless, will take that and more forecasts. I mean, just multiple storms. And we, we're in the middle of a strong inactive phase of the MJO, and it doesn't seem to be having any effect on the storm track. So the reality is you should be very thankful for what you can get. And it also proves that, you know, the MJO is not the absolute begin and end all of determiners of what happens storm track wise. The correlation is much better in the winter months in the Gulf of Alaska, but it's a very kind of at best 50-50 loose association in the Southern Hemisphere, and thank goodness that is the case. So there's swell on the way. That's a good. That's good. Uh, Long-term outlook, and eh, not so much. We think we're moving to La Nina. I mean, you saw it. I'm not going to beat that that dead horse too much, but it's happening this winter. Probably not good for precipitation for down into California. The jet stream will be displaced to the north. If you're looking at skiing, all COVID issues aside, and who knows where we're going to be in re in regards to that as we get into the fall and coming winter months, um, going north would probably be your best option to get snow. It, and it'll probably be a pretty good fire season in California. Likewise, the Atlantic hurricane season probably be pretty busy over there as well. So take appropriate action depending on, you know, if you're skiing or if you have family there or back east or whatever, you know, make your plans accordingly. But that's kind of the way it looks like the cards are going to lay out for the next six months. All right. So if you enjoyed the video, give us a thumbs up right down there. If you haven't subscribed, subscribe. We'd appreciate it. Um, and if you want to follow along, all this data is available on our website, stormsurf.com. Go check it out anytime. Uh, data is there or uh, we'll do this again next week and you can just come along we'll uh, post the video on the website there's links or if you've subscribed you'll get the email all right thanks for watching stay safe and we'll do this again next week same time same channel